in a world that respects no authority. Nothing is sacred. Everything is questioned. Even those of us who profess to follow Christ waver when preferences are challenged. In an age without absolutes, we need a clear picture of who Jesus actually is. The book of Colossians does that. We discover his identity, his power, and his authority. Colossae was located on a trade route from east to west. People passed through with stories, philosophies, and ideas all the time. While it became a melting pot of religions and faiths, it remained a small and relatively insignificant town. The book of Colossians is a letter from Paul, sent to a relatively unknown group of people, living in a humble community on a major highway where people passed through but rarely stayed. Sound familiar? Not sure why that would sound familiar to us, but you know, whatever. Let's uh, let's thank Kyle Patrick for that great introduction. Kyle, part of our uh, feeling team over in the higher part of the high desert. That didn't didn't quite come out right, but they are higher than us, so we're blessed to share ministry with the good uh, folk out at at our site in Phelan and also in Asperia and Apple Valley. We welcome you into the Victorville Auditorium for a few minutes each weekend as we open the Word of God together. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Colossians is what we call it. Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, the group that Kyle uh, introduced us to. Um, and we'll, we'll be there in just a moment. <clears throat> but I want to begin today by venting a little bit. If I might, uh, I wrestled last Saturday, actually all day Saturday, believing I should say something about the tragedy in Florida. Yet another American city is now famous. And if you were here last week, last weekend, you, you might remember that I didn't say anything because I didn't know what to say and uh, went back and forth in my mind about what would be helpful. I didn't want to be another uh, knee-jerk reactor to tragedy. It seems to define public debate after each one of those events. And I read over the last 10 days so many different people weigh in, bloggers, politicians, the list has been pretty long, and I believe they're not, for the most part, at least, even talking about the issues that matter most. So now I've had a few days to reflect, and I hope what I say can add value to the discussion. But we've been reminded once again that demons of violence are not just occasional visitors, but that they have established strongholds of violence in this world. And not just in war zones on the other side of the world, we'd like to compartmentalize that activity geopolitically. But we know we cannot do that. Those same demons who delight in generating international chaos have also been invited to entrench themselves in our own towns, even in our own homes. Oftentimes unwittingly, but maybe it's time to fight back a little harder. Truth is, we don't depend on politicians to solve this country's problems nearly as much as they try to make us believe. So let Washington argue with itself about who deserves to get reelected. And I suggest we take the proverbial bull by the horns and move this country in a new direction ourselves. I wrote a little bit about that this week and posted on my site, tommercer.com. You can go there if you'd like, not necessarily now. God may judge you if you do. <laughs> I hope that what I wrote and the perspective I share I've shared there will be helpful, and if you think it is, then you can share it with your friends by punching any button you want. I get frustrated with tragedy, just like you do, but even more so when I know it's avoidable. And y'all 
to a great degree, this is voidable. And it is completely, completely in the hands of the body of Christ to do something about it. So you can check out what we write there. Let me know what you think. My site's the only social media that I've chosen to employ, so my scope is limited. I offer my perspective humbly, and I just pray that it will bless you. I was thinking as I put all those thoughts together, man, I'm just going to run for office. And then I realized the office I have now as your pastor provides me a greater opportunity to generate change than if I was elected uh, to some other office. So I prefer to stay right where I am for the time being at least, and uh, we're thankful to be able to speak into your lives and hopefully encourage you in that respect. All right. <laughs> so now we're up to 100 votes? I don't know. Yeah, all right. Um, Book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 1. My assignment is the first eight verses as we introduce this incredible letter to you. And I say that. I've made a commitment. I, let me finish my sentence. I say that because it is incredible. It elevates the person and work of Jesus so majestically. But I've made a commitment to read the book of Colossians every day. Throughout the course of the study, it's going to be rather long. Uh, not that we're going to take it through the end of the, the book in this first series. We're going to take it in pieces and talk about chapter 1 and maybe deal with some other things some other series, emphases, and then come back to chapter 2, and then some other things, and come back to chapter 3, and so on. But over the course of the year, you are going to know more about Jesus than you ever knew before, because Paul is that good. And hopefully we'll be able to do justice to this amazing bit of literature that the Holy Spirit gave to our, our brother Paul. But he's an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He writes... Timothy, his brother, our brother in Christ, is also with Paul at the time. And he writes this to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, grace and peace to you from God, our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. It's a very personal letter, a very intimate letter. It's ironic. The Apostle Paul has never been to Colossae. He's never met these people. But the connection that Paul has with them through this Epaphras is powerful. And we'll see that played out throughout the course of this, this series. Colossae was a thriving community several hundred years before Paul was born. But then the Romans began to build their freeway system. A magnificent series of roads and highways, some of which are still being used today, even though they were built 2,000 years ago. Romans were really good at a lot of things. Rather brutal and oppressive in many ways, but they also contributed much to the ancient world, and the freeway system, I call it, was one. But when they built those roads, look what happened. Well, Colossae used to be on a trade route, so it grew and then it just diminished because the new roads went through Hierapolis and Laodicea out to the coast. And by the time Paul writes this letter, this community once thriving was now a suburb at best. By the first century, it became so insignificant that now, even today, 2,000 years later, archaeologists still have not even bothered to excavate the ruins. One historian wrote this. He said, without doubt, Colossae was the least important church to which any epistle of St. Paul is addressed. You may not know what an epistle is. An epistle is a letter written by an apostle. So if you ever come across that word again, now you know. And I know what this guy's thinking. It's not that the people are not significant to Paul. Certainly you'll see that played out in this book because of the passion that he writes with. It's not that the people were insignificant to God because God 
loves all of us. He thinks we're all significant. That's why he sent his son to die for us. But it's an insignificant town in terms of the scope of its influence. It's just a small, almost ghost town now. But there's a little enclave of believers there. The town itself would become a strange brew of Jewish religion, Greek philosophy. And as these Christians tried to gain traction in their faith, some theological problems emerged among the church family. Because the combination of Jewish and Greek traditions formulated a pretty jacked up view of who Jesus actually was. I'm going to introduce many of you to a new term uh, today. Some of you already have studied philosophy and maybe religious thought, and you're familiar with it, but syncretism. It's a new idea for some, but it's a word that describes the merging of different philosophies and views to form a superior religion. It's a perfect description of how so many Christians evolve over time. They take a little bit about what the Bible says. Everybody loves the Bible, right? Everybody loves Jesus. Take a little of Jesus, you know, mix it in with a little bit of what their friends have talked them into. Mix it in with what their favorite celebrity or politician stands for. Mix it all together and they've got their worldview. You know what that is? That's syncretism. And some of you are sitting there thinking, oh, that's me. It's because you're a syncretist. And today you're going to find out that's not a compliment. Especially for a believer. I know, it's hard. (laughs) Most dangerous heresies are not that which openly assail the person of our Lord, but rather those which subtly detract from his dignity while giving the appearance of honoring him. Let me read that again. Everett Harrison said, The most dangerous heresies in your life are not the ones that come to you and tell you Jesus is not important. Because you would hear that and you would say, Well, yes, he is important. You draw the line in the sand, of course he's important. But the most dangerous heresies are the ones who say, yes, Jesus is important, but there are others who are just as important. That's subtle, and it's satanic. Syncretism happens every day. Became very influential in Colossae. It's actually happened to you, many of you. We've got a lot of syncretists in the house these auditoriums, on every site today. Epaphras was probably a native of Colossae. It's probably where he came from. It was his hometown. He's also called Epaphroditus in other places in the New Testament. It's commonly believed that he was just a businessman who gave his heart to Jesus while visiting Ephesus. Probably visiting on business. And it was there in Ephesus that somehow he met the Apostle Paul. Let me throw a curveball to our guys in the booth. Go back to the thank you. You remember that from the first time around here. But I just want to give you a real quick synopsis of what took place on one of Paul's missionary journeys. He took several trips around the world, sharing Christ, planting churches, helping people know Christ, which was his role as a an evangelist and church planter to the Gentile world primarily, the non-Jewish world, what Gentile means ethnically. And so on his first trip, he planted churches all around what is now modern-day Turkey, in case you're wondering where this part of the map actually is, the ancient region known as Asia. And, he, and his friend Barnabas went around and planted all these churches. Well, they came back and celebrated the great successes of that trip. They got together again. They said, let's do it again. Let's go back all throughout this region and encourage the people who have come to know Christ because of our first trip through that area. And it's really weird when you read Acts chapter 16, as hard as those guys tried to get their act together to put this trip that was together, a second trip, there were all these obstacles. And the text actually says that the Holy Spirit would not let Paul go throughout that area again And and share Christ and encourage believers. In fact, what happened is he was so frustrated, he didn't know what to do because he couldn't get traction on that second trip. And so in a dream, God said, well, go over to Macedonia. And so he went over to what is now, you know, the northern part of Greece. On the other side of this water, you got Greece. And then down into ancient Greece. And he had a great time. 
But then at the end of that second trip, he ended up right here. Okay? So now Paul wanted to do this, ended up doing this, and then came back to the city of Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19, we read this. He had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, and this went on for two years. Man, Paul never parks anywhere for two years. He parked in Ephesus two years. Watch this. So that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now watch what happened. Paul said, I want everybody in that region to know Jesus. Jesus said, I do too. Paul said, well, then I'm going. I'm going to every town. And Jesus said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to park you in Ephesus. Have everybody from these communities, or representatives at least from these communities, just intersect with you in Ephesus. You lead them to Christ. You disciple them and then send them back to their own people. Because, Paul, they're going to be more effective in their hometowns, with their families, with their friends. Are you ready for this? With their oikos. <laughs> than even you as an apostle could ever hope to be. It's just a tremendous story. And Epaphras is this guy from Colossae. And he comes to faith in Ephesus, somehow connecting, 95% chance, there was a connection between Epaphras and Paul from a friend of Epaphras who was probably another businessman who had come to faith. He meets Paul, becomes a Christian, goes back and plants this church in Colossae. And now years later, he's frustrated because the gospel in Colossae had been compromised with all these views, these significant in that community, significant philosophies, Jewish philosophies, Greek philosophies, pagan philosophies about who Jesus was. And so Epaphras decides, you know what? I'm going to go talk to my spiritual father, Paul. You know, looked him up, figured out where he was. Paul was in Rome at the time. In fact, he was under house arrest. He was awaiting trial in Rome. So Epaphras goes from Colossae all the way to Rome to meet with Paul and say, Paul, we got this this problem in our church. These people don't really understand who Jesus is and for whatever reason, they're not listening to me. And so what Paul did is he leveraged his office, the office of apostle, in order to communicate the majesty of Jesus to eradicate all these crazy ideas that had permeated the church family. You notice how he starts this letter? I am Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. You know what that is? That's a big deal. That's what that is. We use the term apostle like, you know, every day. We say, oh, apostle Peter, apostle John, apostle Paul, who cares? Those people cared because it was such a small fraternity of, of guys who were apostles. The office of apostle was reserved for those who had been personally commissioned by Jesus Christ himself, had had a conversation with Jesus I mean, not like you do in your prayers and I do in my prayers, and he speaks to us through his still, small voice, but an audible face-to-face -face discussion with Jesus himself. If you didn't have that, you couldn't be an apostle. And that small group of apostles had authority in the church that was essentially unquestioned. In fact, when Paul's writing the Corinthians and they're giving him a bad time, he says this, uh, the First Corinthians passage 9-1, he says, what are you guys doing? Am I not an apostle? Now we read that and we just kind of just keep going. You got to stop and take that in. If you're in the first century, Paul is saying, he's reminding them, I'm an apostle, so cool your jets and listen to me. And then he identifies how you become an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? Some of you might remember in Acts chapter one, um, they replaced Judas. You remember Judas, he fell off the wagon. Yeah. He's not, you know, in the group of 12 anymore, and it's a group of 12. I mean, even in prophetic literature, we got all this, you know, we got 12 apostles, so how are we going to fill that slot? So they had a selection process, not very sophisticated, you read about it, and they, they picked Matthias to be the 12th apostle. Some of us, believe, and that was fine. I mean, the Bible just tells us what everybody did, not necessarily that what they did was always the right thing. But some of us believe that when Paul had his encounter on the road to Damascus, you know, he's Saul at that point. He's Saul of Tarsus. He hates the Christians. 
He gets letters from the authorities to persecute Christians in Damascus. He takes his little entourage of temple guard. He's going to go put all the Christians in Damascus in jail. And on the road, guess who showed up? Jesus. And Paul then Saul. He said, well, who are you? And Jesus said, uh, hello, I'm Jesus, the guy you're trying to persecute. I mean, what are you thinking, man? And he on the spot transformed Saul into a believer and commissioned him as an apostle. So a lot of us think that actually it's Paul who's going to fill that 12th slot in eternity. I don't know, we'll see. But Paul was a really smart guy. Paul's intellectual wheelhouse was so broad. He was an expert on history. He was an expert on the law. He was an expert on theology and philosophy. There was no smarter guy in, in the world at that time. I'm, I'm pretty sure that would be an accurate statement to make. And he knew religion. He knew syncretism. He knew these heretical views that could so contaminate a church's ministry. In fact, the typical sequence that he was familiar with is no different than the one we find today in some Christians' lives, even maybe some of yours. For example, here's the sequence. People put their faith in Jesus. How many of you have placed your faith in Jesus? Raise your hand at all the sites, please. Okay, so there's a few of you. Great. All right, place your faith in Jesus. Then what happens is that um, a lot of Christians fail to learn enough about the Jesus they just place their faith in. And because of that, they don't appreciate his greatness. You know what I call that? I call that passive ignorance. It's not that you're trying to do anything wrong. You're just not doing something that's really right and really, really important to do. And that's to grow in your faith and understand who Jesus is. Just all the perks of being a believer. And then what happens? Because of your, your passive ignorance. I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm not trying to be overly critical. I'm just an analyst here. It's what it is. You guys don't take this seriously. Understanding who Jesus is. Then there are false teachers that use, I guess what we could call a passive aggressive approach to subtly introducing these crippling false doctrines. They always have a gentle smile on their face. And maybe you've run into one of them. They say things like, yeah, I used to believe Christianity. All that stuff. Yeah, I used to believe that. Just like you though, I was a victim of their judgmental attitudes. And the fact that they just, they just hate people. They're haters. They hate people who don't agree with them on everything. And then I discovered that you can still believe in Jesus. You don't have to believe all that other stuff. See, have you heard from them? If you haven't yet, they will come knocking. But some of you have fallen for that. Beth Moore, some of you ladies will certainly recognize that name. She wrote this. She said, you'll watch a generation of Christians set the Bible aside in order to become more like Jesus. Now just soak that in for a minute. Set the Bible aside so that they can become more like, like Jesus. And stunningly, she concludes, it will sound completely plausible. See, it's no surprise that people who perceive Jesus as less than he is will serve him with less than they have. You can fill in those blanks. Why don't Christians love the Lord with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength as we began this year with our, with our goals? Remember that? Why do so many Christians fail in, in that regard? It's because of their view of Jesus. When you elevate your friends' ideas, when you elevate your favorite celebrity or polit politician's ideas to the level of what God's word says, then you have detracted from the uniqueness, from the greatness from the majesty and the authority of Jesus Christ. No matter what we try to teach you from this stage. And you know I get pretty excited. I'm already pretty excited. I don't know what's going to happen in the next few minutes. But I'm already like off the charts in excitement here. No matter what I try to share with you. And I can be very passionate. I'm exhausted by the time I'm done with you guys. Every weekend I'm exhausted. But I share it with passion. We try to be clear. We try to connect the dots between what the Bible says, what God says, what Jesus stands for, and the way you live your life. But I will tell you this. Your view of who Jesus is to you will affect your enthusiasm for whatever we say. Ever. 
We just launched a capital campaign last three weeks. Thank you for your response. Now some of you are wondering, what do, what do I do? And we essentially said you should give to the campaign because this is part of Christ's church. Nobody argues that. Nobody's going to say, no, Jesus has his church, but HTC is not part of that. You want to be a part of Christ's church? Well, you're part of High Desert Church. That's our church family. This is our local representation, just like the people in Colossae. We are the High Desertians, <laughs> not the Colossians. And so you say, yeah, I want to participate. Well, so what does that participation look like? Because the more important Jesus, the head of this church, is to you, the more you're willing to get involved in what he's accomplishing through his church. You might say, okay, I got 100 bucks. What do I do? Join the campaign or pay direct TV? Okay, that's a cheap shot. <laughs> I, just know, I just know your television provider. How important is your television provider to you? And you're, right now, you would say, well, I'd rather not talk about that if that's okay. And I'm just saying, it, just be honest. Let's just be intellectually honest here. That might be brutal, but that's one of the realities of, of faith. Recognizing your choices reflect more than just an up or down vote on things. Your choices reflect what you believe in your heart are the most important things in your life. And don't get mad at me because Jesus said it. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What's important to you? Look at your checkbook. That's what Jesus Christ said. Mercerized version, maybe. Yeah. And I could list other issues, not just finances. Talk about cohabitation. People living together before they're married. I could talk about divorce on demand. Divorcing because of irreconcilable differences. I could talk about failing to report income to the IRS. Okay, I'm meddling now. I'm sorry. It's not the right time of year to bring that up. <laughs> All that to say is, why do you make the choices you make? Do you make the choices based on what Jesus said or choices based on what your friends told you were okay? Or what this culture that the church has been evidently crippled by is trying to tell us is appropriate. See, you're a syncretist. Let's just be honest. And maybe Paul's apostolic position as he leveraged it for the Colossians, will also be recognized by us. And I love his bio, his intro, first couple of verses, because there's balance to it. He says, I'm an apostle. But he also says, I'm writing to my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not just, I have authority here, so submit to me, <laughs> which actually apostolic authority, <laughs> we should. But he says, uh, I also love you like family. I really care for you. I don't even know you. But we're family. In fact, in verse 2, he talks about different elements of our familial relationship. We're the Haggioi, God's holy people. Some of your older translations say to the saints. See, a saint is not someone recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, they can do what they want. I'm just going to what the Bible says. The Bible says, if you are a believer in Christ, you are part of the Haggioi. You are a saint. The word saint means, the word holy, it just means to be set apart. God is holy because he's set apart from all the other gods we worship. The Bible is the holy Bible because it's a book that's unique. It's set apart from all the other philosophies and religious ideas in the world. And you are holy because you're set apart. The only people in the world who are holy are Jesus followers. And Paul's saying, hey, we follow Jesus. We're all in this together. We all have faith in the same Jesus. He says, grace and peace to you. Now, you read that a lot in the New Testament. And um, throughout my life, I would read that grace and peace to you. And I would see it as a sequence. And it made sense. You're not going to have peace until you experience grace. If there's no grace in your home, there's no peace in your home. If there's no grace in a relationship, it's not a peaceful relationship. If you don't experience God's grace in your life, then unfortunately, you will not experience peace in your relationship with God. Grace leads to peace. And I'm not saying that's not right. I'm just saying there's a whole other layer 
to when these apostles would greet an audience with grace and peace. See, when Paul says grace, he's talking to the Greeks. It was a very typical, a very common greeting. In fact, it was the most welcoming, intimate greeting that one Greek would give another. Generally, they would just say greetings. But if it was somebody they loved, they would say grace to you. And then the Jews, what did the Jews say? It was their shalom. See, if you're a Greek, I mean, we're all in this together. It doesn't matter your ethnic background. You Jewish Christians, we're family. I'm here as an apostle. I'm here as a spiritual father. I'm here as your brother and sister in Christ. And then in verse 3 through verse 7, which is the bulk of what we're sharing today, and and you'll fill in some blanks soon, don't worry. Probably thinking, Tom, we're never going to finish. That's not true. This is my third round, so I know we do complete this presentation. Verses 3 through 7. You know what it is in the Greek? It's one sentence, which the (laughs) the New Testament translators, they break it up into different sentences because of the English language. You're not allowed that luxury. You can't just go on and on and on and on and on. This is a sentence that lasts 123 words. And that's not even a record for Paul. When Paul wrote the Ephesians, their letter, the book of Ephesians, church in Ephesus, he had a sentence in chapter one, 240 words long. And I'm thinking, what, God gets wound up, man. He doesn't even have the time to put a, a period at the end of a sentence. And that's exactly what happens. You know, when Paul gets on a roll, It's almost like he's caught up in the spirit and you can't shut him up. And you want to suggest a topic that the Apostle Paul will just go on and on and on and on and on about? Just bring up Jesus. The one that stopped him on that Damascus road. From day one, the Apostle Paul knew exactly who that guy was. And trying to convince people like you and me of that. That can, be, that can be a job, man. And, and Paul wants us all to know how grateful he is for what God accomplished through his son, Jesus. The purpose of this letter is not to elevate Paul as an apostle. Paul leverages his apostolic office and his familial connection in order to elevate the resume of Jesus to the church. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the love you have for all of God's people. Uh, this is, there's so much here, and I apologize. Go back to that last one just for a minute. <clears throat> your faith in Christ. Um, let me show you what that is because this is really cool. In the Greek, next, next is in Christo, in Christ. We talk here about placing your faith in Christ, taking your faith out of someone or something, generally, your own opinions, and placing your faith in Christ. Now you have faith in Christ. But had Paul, and that's true, but had Paul wanted to communicate that here, he would have used a different preposition. He would have used a Greek ice or epi, not en. To say that we have faith and we are in Christ means that we are literally in Christ. You ever wondered how you're going to get away with getting through the pearly gates? If they're pearly, I don't even know. And, you know, God's there and he sees you coming and you know, you know, you've been an idiot and you know that even after coming to faith, you made so many mistakes and you've been so crazy wrong so often. And as you're cruising up and there is Jesus and you're thinking, I just really hope I can get into heaven. You know why you and I are going to get into heaven? Because we're in Christ. As we're walking up, the Father doesn't even see us. He sees Christ. Because we're in Christ. Jesus becomes the environment in which we live. That's what Paul is saying. And that's a profound thought. You see, when you're in Christ, you breathe different air. When you're in Christ... You see more clearly. When you're in Christ, you're having conversations that reflect a different energy with other people because that's what it means to be in Christ. He is the environment in which we live. He saved us forever. He sustains us every day because we're in Christ. I know that sounds really theological, so even though this is a really lousy example, I'm going to give it to you anyway. 
It's the best my simple mind could come up with. So you're walking outside, and there's a fire in the mountains. That's not too much of a stretch. And the wind is blowing. Are you with me so far? And as it's blowing, this billowing smoke and these embers, you wonder if you're going to survive. It is absolutely pitch dark outside. There's no moon. There's no lights. You're stumbling around. You hear other people, but you don't know what to do, trying to save yourself. And then all of a sudden, you stumble into this auditorium or the one you're sitting at at one of our other sites. When you come inside and now you're in building, the air you breathe is different. The clarity with which you're able to see around you is different. The energy that you bring to your conversations with others who are in the room is different. You know what this building did? This building saved your life. And as long as you are in this building, it will sustain you. We're in Christ. He is our life now. But here's the kicker. <clears throat> if you're living in Christ, it means you're loving in Christ as well. You can't claim to be in Christ and not love what Christ loves. That's what Paul talks about, the love for all of God's people. You see, when we talk about God's people, we're talking about the church, and not just High Desert Church, not just one site. We're talking about the body of Christ throughout the world. If we are all in Christ, we're all in this essence together, then we must show love to one another. New Testament refers to the church. The church, all of God's people as the bride of Christ. I cannot tell you how many times people tell me, I love Jesus, but I just don't want to be a part of the church. It's not allowed. Not if you're in Christ. See, if you're in Jesus, then you love what Jesus loves. And you know what Jesus really loves? He loves his bride. You can't say, Jesus, I love you. I just can't stand your bride. I want to hang out with you, Jesus, not with your wife, though. It's like saying you want to be in the NFL. I'm going to play in the NFL someday. I just don't want to be on a team. <laughs> Comes to the territory, bro, in the NFL. You got no choice. You got to be on a team. And you know what team we're on in Christ? The church. That's our team. Church is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's, it's bigger than any set of opinions represented in this body. And we might not agree on everything. But we got to love each other. And if you don't love in Christ, then you might want to ask the question, are you even living in Christ? And then Paul gives some reasons in this sentence, this rambling sentence. He gives reasons why he has never, ever looked outside of this building for advice. Why he's never, ever gone anywhere else to get what he needs to make decisions and to sustain him in his walk than Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. First of all, he says there's no more secure hope than what we found in him. If you can find more security in somebody else than what you got in Jesus, then take it. Go for it. You can't find a secure hope anywhere else like you find in him. Something really interesting here, and I don't even know how much to get into it. But it says the, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven... Now, in the, in, the, in the Greek New Testament, that's plural. It's heavens. So now the translators, they've got a decision to make. Is Paul trying to say we got this hope in heaven? We, we, we know that we're secure in our faith and that someday we're going to heaven. And by the way, nobody else can provide that kind of security for you, right? Or is it the heavenly realms, the plural form, which it, which it actually is in the Greek? Is that what Paul means? That in the heavenly realms, you've got this incredible spiritual battle going on. You know, and we're getting bombarded by, you know, Satan and his, his minions, the demons. And they're constantly harassing us. But we are secure because of the war that Jesus fights for us every single day in the heavenly realms. And the fact that his holy angels are just fighting for us, for our survival every day bottom line is it really doesn't matter which way you want to translate it. It's still true. Our hope is in Jesus now. Our hope will forever be in Jesus. Our hope, we have a secure hope. What do you hope for? 
What do you hope that God will do for you, that God will do in you, that God will do through you? You know, we have some pretty shallow hopes, right? I hope I get a financial windfall someday. Maybe you play lottery games. Maybe you enter contests. And I'm not here to, you know, condemn that. Um, might not be the wisest use of your time and money, but, you know, whatever. I'm just saying that there's this desire in all of our hearts that if nothing else, we'd have this rich uncle that we didn't even know was our uncle and that he died and we got this big check. If that happened to you today, raise your hand if you'd be happy about it. Come on, you guys are lying to me. Of course you'd be happy about it. Say, is this a trick question? No. It's like, you know, you'd get more. That's, that'd, be, that'd be wonderful. It's kind of a shallow hope. I hope my Dodgers win the World Series this time around. Okay, that's a hope. God's will was not done last year, obviously. So that's my hope. Here's one. I hope I get finished. I hope I get finished in time for lunch. Because I'm really hungry already. And I, I just hope I can finish this up in time for lunch. But so many of our hopes, we use that term all the time for such shallow things. But let me talk to you about the hope that matters. I hope my marriage will be successful. That's a big deal. I hope my children will find fulfillment in Christ. It's important. I hope I'll have enough resources to enjoy life my entire life. Nothing wrong with that. Let me just break this down for you. You know who you should follow to secure all of those hopes that mean something? Jesus. Follow anybody else. <laughs> it's just like, why would you do that? There's no, but secondly, no more accurate source than his word. Verse 5, which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. Paul says, Colossians, you already have the truth in the Bible. Why are you going somewhere else to get your truth? You've got the true message. You know, you've got a board. I, I, we all have this advisory board, this advisory group, and we ask them for advice. I don't know who's on your board. Let's just... You know, in your mind's eye, think about a big round table and you invite all of your, all of your advisors in, right? You've got, you got Jesus. I mean, he's in the group, of course. You got Oprah. Some of you got Bernie. Some of you got your best friend forever. Some of you, Ben Shapiro or Tucker, you know, you watch too much Fox News. And then you got your, your YouTube blogger or your Pinterest blogger. And everybody has their favorites. It's like, hey, what are they saying today? What do they say about everything? I got a problem. I don't know what to do. I got a, I got a confused mind. I have to make a decision. So I assemble my board. Okay, now just imagine that. And then imagine, as this should not be too hard to imagine, they don't all agree on what you ought to do. They don't agree with one another and a fight breaks out. And they're arguing and you don't know. Now it's a matter of, okay, who do I believe? Well, you need to make a commitment before you even convene a meeting that if there's ever a difference of opinion, this guy is the one we listen to. And some of you have not allowed that to happen because you've taken what he has said and you've thought to yourself, I don't feel comfortable with that. Let me see what Oprah says. <laughs> Let me see what Tucker says. And then they say it, and then you think, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm more comfortable with that, so I'm not going to exclude Jesus completely from the discussion. But now his status has been what? Diminished. And that's the beginning of the end for vitality in the Christian faith. So you make that determination ahead of time. As we say in the notes, fill in a blank or two. Any conversation with God without a commitment to God always leads to confusion about God. And the Colossians were confused about Jesus because they hadn't made that commitment that what he says trumps everybody. Here's number three. There's no more forgiving friend than Jesus. No more forgiving friend than Jesus. Nobody loves you like Jesus loves you. Nobody forgives you as completely as Jesus can. Let me just ask this question and then you can just think about it. It's a rhetorical question. Don't answer out loud, but we're just going to see how smart you are. Um, I ask you the question, who, who in your life loves you unconditionally besides Jesus? The answer is nobody. 
Now, there are some people in your life you're close to, hopefully you're married to one of them if you're married, who has less conditionality than the average person in that guy's life or that gal's life. We love less conditionally, some, than others. But nobody loves unconditionally. There's always conditions. Oh, I love you, baby, but if you ever did that. (laughs) Right? I'm like so out of here. It's like less conditionally, not unconditionally. There's one. You don't even love, you don't love anybody unconditionally. You don't even love God unconditionally. Because when something goes wrong in your life, who's the first one you blame? Hey, what's up with that? Why'd you let that happen? Grumble. You might come back. It might not take long. There's only one unconditional lover in the world. So I kind of like being a grandpa. I love my kids. I love, Cheryl and I, we just loved, loved, loved our children. But when they did something wrong, if they broke something, it was a teaching moment. Sit down, son. (laughs) Okay, this is what's going to happen now, bro. Uh, That was stupid. And you're going to have to pay for it. You're either going to have to take money out of your allowance that you saved up. You're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to fix this. I need to teach you responsibility. Then you got grandchildren in the future. Grandchild breaks something. What do you do? You fix it. That's what you do. (laughs) And then you take them out for an ice cream sundae. That's exactly what you do. That's why... That's why I seldom think of God the Father anymore. I'm always thinking of God the Grandfather because at least that's closer. You know, the Grandfather has less conditions than a father. But with God, I mean, who loves you more than him? Ernest Hemingway wrote about a Spanish father who because of a long past conflict was estranged from his son. And he just couldn't take it anymore. He just loved his son too much to let it continue. He knew his son still lived in Madrid, but he didn't know how to get a hold of him. He had lost all, all of his numbers, any way to communicate. And so he took an ad out in the Madrid newspaper, and it read this way. This is what the ad said. Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. I love you. As Hemingway tells the story, the next day at noon, 800 boys named Paco had gathered in front of the main office. <laughs> You know why? Because people are looking for God's grace more than they're looking for anything. People are desperate for forgiveness. People in your life are desperate to be forgiven. Just like you are. If you're withholding forgiveness from anybody, especially in the body of Christ, and you're withholding that grace, And that tells me you haven't come to truly understand God's grace. To implement that in your personal life. To extend forgiveness. And I'm not expecting unconditional because we're all idiots. Someday we'll love that way. But in this life, it's going to be a tarnished version to some degree. But certainly we can extend ourselves one more step to offer people what they want what they need so much. And by the way, if you are ever forgiving, you will be more Christ-like in that moment than in any other thing you do in your life. You want to be like Jesus? Then step up to the plate, man. And Paul says to the Colossians, when it comes to forgiveness, where are you going to find more forgiveness than Jesus? Seriously? I mean, if he wrote country music, the Apostle Paul, he would have written the song, y'all are looking for love in all the wrong places. (laughs) Looking for love in too many faces. You already have Jesus. Who loves you more than Jesus? And by the way, once you receive that grace and understand that grace and extend that grace, grace is what others will notice more about you than anything else. The fact that you're gracious. They'll notice that more than how smart you are. They'll notice that that more than than all the other things you might know theologically. They'll notice that more than all of the things that you can provide a church in terms of resources. They'll notice that more in terms uh, than, than any other thing you could do in terms of serving in a church. Keep that in mind. And lastly, there's no better job than the one he gave us. I just love this so much. 
The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you. God is growing his church the same way that he was growing the people in Colossae. How? By someone coming to faith and going home to their oikos, going home to their family and friends. And he says, Epaphras, man, you learned it. You learned it from Epaphras. Props to you, our dear fellow servant, a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And he told us, so often about your love for the Spirit. This is a great Oikos story. God called Epaphras to a great job. You know, he had a business, probably. I mean, read between the lines. He had a business in Colossae that took him on the trade route to Ephesus where he conducted more business. He showed up for work, and he came to Jesus, and Jesus gave him a new job. And I would just tell you, you got the same job this week. You don't have a Colossian church. You got your own group whom God has supernaturally and strategically platformed you right in the middle of those people. That is your hometown. And he wants to use you to change the spiritual landscape of that group. He is calling you to your job as a believer. I, if I were to say, what do you do for a living? Many of you would immediately default as I would. I'd say, I'm a pastor. That's my vocation. I don't care who cuts your checks. I don't care who pays your bills. I will tell you this. We all have got the same job. It's the greatest job in the world. It has more meaning than any other job we could be given. It provides more purpose eternally than anything else we could ever accomplish in our lives. And that is to reflect the greatness of Jesus to this group of people around us who are just confused. They're syncretists, for heaven's sake. And that needs to change because Jesus is better than that. That's what this whole letter's about. And uh, so anyway, we're going to have fun. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace to us. Thank you, Lord. Uh, our applause is the applause that we hear from you. For us. You applaud us. Lord, you love us so much and you get so excited when we make connections that last in our lives and connections with others and connections with an eternal God. Father, thank you for the privilege of being a believer in this great Jesus. And with everybody's head bowed and your eyes closed, some of you may have wandered into one of these rooms and you're thinking, oh, maybe there's something more to this Jesus thing than I thought. Well, yeah. Yeah, there is. And if you'll admit that, you need help in your life. Shouldn't be too tough unless you're completely dishonest with yourself. If you would believe that Jesus is the only help, God the Father sent the world. He sent Jesus. If he doesn't help you, you don't get help. And if you choose to place your faith in him, praying this prayer right now, Father in heaven, I would ask you to change my life through the presence of your son. I choose to invite him into my heart and I ask that you would place me in him forever. That's what it means to be a believer, to be a Christian. And he will answer that prayer. No doubt in my mind. So Lord, give us a great week. Help us to be mindful of the greatness of Jesus. It's in his great name, great, great name. All God's children said.